It is now time for question period. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Member for Timmins will come to order. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to whoever on the other side wants to answer it. Uh, school boards are facing. Order. Order. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition for interrupting her. Start the clock. The question is to uh, the Premier Speaker. School boards are facing overwhelming challenges this year as a result of cuts imposed by the Ford government. They're being forced to fire teachers, lay off education workers, and courses on everything from hands-on technical learning to arts education are being eliminated. The Premier finally backed down on his plans to impose retroactive cuts to municipalities this year and agreed to hold the consultations he should have been holding in the first place. Will he now agree to do the same thing with school boards? I recognize the Acting Premier. Thank you very much. Well, I want to begin by reminding the people of Ontario that the previous government was spending $40 million a day more than they took in, and we have developed a budget that was passed yesterday that puts us on a path to balance. It's a five-year path to balance, but, Speaker, it protects what matters most. It protects our health care and it protects our education. In fact, we're adding. $1.4 billion over the next three years in the education budget, $700 million increase in education budget this year, $1 billion, $1 billion to create 30,000 childcare spaces. In fact, 10,000 of them will be in schools. Speaker, these are the kinds of things that we have passed in our budget yesterday, increasing the education budget that the NDP voted against yesterday. They voted against the $700 million increase into the education budget. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, what we did was vote for the people of Ontario by voting against that terrible budget. <laughs> But look, once again, the Premier I and mean, apparently his finance minister didn't do their homework, and our kids are the ones who get punished for that. Yesterday, the Toronto District School Board started issuing bumping notices as more teachers are displaced due to government cuts. Uh, the Halton Board has heard from 7,000 parents who reject the government's cuts to class sizes and mandatory e-learning. I'm sure if they were here, they would have voted against the budget too. They're calling for consultation before these cuts are rolled out. Will the Premier provide it. Okay. Yeah, I think Premier. Minister of Education. The Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, it's it's an honour to serve in the role of education and as minister. And I have to share with you that since we've been in this position almost a year now, we've come to realise that there's a lot of waste throughout Ontario that needs to be addressed. And when we conducted our consultation this past fall, teachers, parents, community-minded people and students alike pointed their fingers when we were talking about efficiencies, they pointed their fingers towards school boards saying there is a lot of opportunity for school boards to look from within and see and identify ways that they could realize efficiencies. And so that's what we're asking school boards across this province to do. You know, while we're increasing our budget contribution Spons. to education to the tune of $700 million, $90 million of which is going to special education, we're increasing funding for student transportation, the list could just go on and on. We're asking school boards to find Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's pretty disappointing for the children and the parents of this province to see an education minister that refuses to acknowledge the devastation that her cuts are going to cause. Consequences are for our kids and their futures, and they are devastating consequences. They mean, of course, fired teachers, larger class sizes, fewer course options, and more cuts in the classroom. 
The Premier finally admitted, as I said, uh, that it was wrong to cut public health, wrong to cut childcare, wrong to cut emergency services this year. Why is he so unwilling to consider taking some time before imposing these reckless cuts that will have lasting impacts on our students in our schools? Do you know, do you know, Speaker, I completely reject the fear-mongering that continues to come from the Leader of the Opposition. The fact of the matter is, we know there is opportunities for school boards to sharpen their pencils, and in no way should students suffer because of mismanagement. You know, we have school boards throughout Ontario that are working with us. They're saving one to four cents on the dollar from within, so they're not impacting the classroom. But unfortunately, we have other school boards that seemingly the members of the opposition are propping up to, to add to the cause of anxiety throughout this province. They're propping them up and saying, you know what, it's okay that you've been unaccountable and you've mismanaged or carried a deficit for the last four or five years. That's okay, because that's their mentality. But, Speaker, Response. we were elected with a mandate to get Ontario back on track, and we invite the school boards across this province here, here. to work with us to reduce wasteful spending from within and make sure we have a good learning environment. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the official Opposition. Uh, well, Speaker, my next uh, question is to the Premier. But I have to say the Minister of Education doesn't even understand that school boards can't run deficits. So that's pretty worrisome. Uh, but I do want to say before I bring my uh, before Order. I bring my question forward that of course we have a, a very important game today, which is the Raptors game, and I think everybody in this legislature is excited about that. Maybe we'll change the tone a little bit here. I uh, just uh, want to say that it's really great to see so many cities that are getting involved as well, so many communities. I hope people are safe out there. I hope some people behave well and are safe, and uh, wish the police forces all the very best in their um, efforts to uh, to keep everybody safe and well. So. Uh, on that note, uh, my next question, again, as I said, is to the Premier. Uh, the Premier's claims that families won't be facing health care cuts is looking less and less credible by the day. Among the $2.7 billion in cuts uh, found by Ontario's Independent Financial Accountability Office Order. was actually a $22 million cut to cancer screening. Member for King Bond, come a $22 to order. million dollar cut to cancer screening. Sorry to stop the clock. The member for King Vaughan is warned. Start the clock. Leader of the Official Opposition. I'll take the opportunity to say that again, then, Speaker. It was a $22 million cut to cancer screening, a reduction of nearly 20 per cent. Can the Premier explain the rationale for eliminating one fifth of Ontario's budget for cancer screening? The Acting Premier. Speaker, thank you for the question. I need to continue to remind this legislature about the many investments that we are making. We're starting already with an increase in the health budget of $1.3 billion this year alone, a budget that this NDP opposition voted against. We are adding $384 million Opposition to the hospitals, $267 million to home care, $1.75 billion to create 15,000 new long-term care beds, many of which are already uh, in the ground, started in the ground today. $90 million. I've said this many days now. I cannot believe the NDP voted against this. $90 million Order. against providing free dental care to 100,000 low-income seniors. How dare you? How dare you vote against those seniors? Order. Okay. Order. 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 It seems appropriate to remind the members we have a large number of guests who are with us today in the House to observe our proceedings. And we have to think about what standard we hope to set today and how impressed they'll be when, when they leave. 
And I'd ask all members to think about that. Start the clock. The uh, Leader of the Opposition, I believe, had the floor. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I have to say what I can't believe is that this minister is still trying to spin the budget. The fact yeah. of the matter is the financial accountability officer is independent, and he has identified $2.7 billion in cuts to the health care system. Yeah. But i got to say, cancer, cancer screening is absolutely vital for the detection of cancer. It can literally save lives. Of all the Premier's cut first, plan later budget decisions, this may have the most serious consequences for people. Will the Ford government reverse this cut before Ontarians' lives are literally put at risk? The Acting Premier. Minister of Labour. Referred to the Minister of Labour. To the leader of the opposition, what message is she not hearing from this government? We have increased spending in health Member for Waterloo, this come year to, to totaling $63.5 million. The member for Waterloo is warned. The member, for, the Minister of Labour, had the floor. So, Mr. Speaker, we've increased spending in health care by uh, and totaling $63.5 billion. We have made investments in low-income seniors' dental, $384 million in hospital operational funding, $27 billion over 10 years for hospital infrastructure spending, $174 million for mental health and addiction services, $267 million increase in home and community care, 15,000 more long-term care beds, over half of which, which have been like announced, 15,000 more long-term care beds. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why the opposition. Thank you. <clears throat> Stop the clock. Order. Order. The member for Carleton will come to order. The Solicitor General has to come to order. Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek has to come to order. Start the clock. The Leader of the Opposition. Fine. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, it wasn't so long ago that Conservatives supported independent officers of the Legislature like the Financial Accountability Officer, officer but now they expect us to ignore the experts. Well, we're not going to do that, Speaker. Nobody believes this government anymore, and we certainly are seeing the evidence from the FAO to back up what people know, which is the budget spin is not the case, and that, in fact, these cuts are going to hurt families very, very deeply. Um, the evidence is clear. Cuts to cancer screening. Cuts to public health. Cuts to hospital funding, a total of $2.7 billion in cuts to the health care budget, and a return to the Mike Harris era of closing hospitals, closing hospital beds, and firing nurses. Why won't the government admit that these cuts have consequences for families and consequences for our health care system? The question has been referred to the Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, I will again reiterate some of the many, many investments we've made in health care, like $384 million additional funding in hospital operational funding, $27 billion uh, over 10 years for hospital infrastructure spending, $267 million increase in home and community care, long-term care beds investments, over 7,000 of those already announced of the 15,000 promised, redeveloping 15,000 long-term care beds. Mr. Speaker, the government has seen what the Liberals and the NDP have done to health care, and that is like a thousand people waiting for health care in the hallways of the hospitals that we have now, backlogs of 30-some thousand people waiting for long-term care beds. That's what you did when you supported that Liberal government. Response. That's the state of the health care system you gave us. Order.
start the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, questions also to the Premier, but I have to say, I don't know how a $2.7 billion cut in health care is going to solve hallway medicine, Speaker. It's not. It's going to get much, much worse with this government. The people deserve better than that. But as we speak here today, there's another issue that's very concerning unfolding uh, in our province, Speaker. The people of Pekanjikum First Nation are facing serious threats from a forest fire. Uh, a state of emergency has been declared. Yesterday, I spoke with Chief Amanda uh, Senawap about the need for more planes to be uh, uh, assigned to help get people out of uh, her community. Can the Premier tell us uh, what help the uh, Ontario, province of Ontario is prepared to provide to the community? Denies the acting premier. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Refer to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the honourable member's question. I can assure her that fire crews and fire aircraft started fighting this fire uh, yesterday at 1.30 this morning. It's been a very late night and a very early morning, Mr. Speaker, as the Joint Response Coordination Centre, including the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre, together with the Department of National Defence, have, have, have uh, mobilized fixed-wing aircraft from Ontario and Hercules from the Department of National Defense. As we speak, people are being evacuated, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to appreciate the uh, late night text between myself, the member of provincial parliament from Kiewatenan. We've coordinated our efforts with Chief, uh, Grand Chief Alvin Fidler and uh, Chief uh, Amanda Sanawap, a tremendous leader here. The community is under siege and the province of Ontario has mobilized all of its resources to move people out of that community safely. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, I spoke to the Chief uh, yesterday and expressed, she expressed to me her concern that smoke from the approaching fire may soon hinder visibility of aircraft to land. Uh, this is a community that, of course, is still re reeling from a youth suicide crisis uh, that just lost another young person to suicide on Tuesday night. It is clearly a time where every bit of help, mat help matters. It's our understanding that evacuation is very slow uh, because there's only 80 to 100 people that can fit on every plane, and there's only really one plane that's doing evacuation. So we need more planes there uh, to get more people evacuated more quickly. Uh, I appreciate uh, the minister's response and uh, the government's uh, actions. That Thus far, uh, but I guess what I'm asking for is a commitment to ensure that we unconditionally provide all the help that's needed uh, to support the people of Kanja come and get them out of harm's way. Thank you. Again, recognize the Minister of Indigenous Affairs to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious matter, and I can assure the member that all uh, assets with respect to aircraft have been uh, have been mobilized. Uh, what we're trying to do now, in my most recent conversation with Chief Amanda Sanawap, uh, community leaders across northwestern Ontario, is to identify towns and cities in northwestern Ontario that can be uh, either hubs or destination cities. Pekanjikum has close ties to Dryden, Kenora. Uh, these would be more appropriate places as the initial uh, evacuations are going to Kapuskasing. We appreciate the folks in Kapuskasing for their efforts. They're very good at this, but it's 860 kilometres away from Pekanjikum. Timmins, another host city, is some 920 kilometres away, Mr. Speaker. I've spoken to mayors from across northwestern Ontario, uh, hotel operators that I have close ties with, and we're mobilizing quickly to ensure that these folks have a safe, comfortable place to, to be while uh, we deal with this emergency. In the community itself, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Natural Resources has planes uh, coming in and out of there to, to deliver fire crews as the community may be at risk, Mr. Speaker. That means soaking down buildings, but as well moving people out. We have every plane possible uh, helping Pekanjikum at this time, and I appreciate everybody's uh, support in this place at this time for those efforts. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Markham Stouffville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my, my question is to the, uh, the Minister of uh, Economic Development and the Government House Leader. Uh, Minister, 15 years of Liberal governance in Ontario brought reckless spending that has buried our province in debt. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know you're happy to, uh, to appreciate that the days of abusing taxpayers' dollars are over in the province of Ontario. Ontario voters demanded value for their money when they headed to the polls last year. Speaker, voters across our province elected a PC government knowing that a change in our leadership at Queen's Park would deliver greater transparency and accountability to Ontarians. Since taking office, this government has taken a proactive measures to stand up for Ontarians. Speaker, we have done so much, and I'm wondering if the 
uh, minister could remind this House of the steps our government has taken to support the hard-working people across our great province. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Markham Stouffville for the question this morning. I also want to thank him for the outstanding work that he's doing in representing the constituents in his riding and also assisting our Minister of Energy in ensuring that we're cleaning up the Liberal Hydro mess and the great work he's doing as a parliamentary assistant there. Speaker, we were elected on a promise to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario, and that's exactly what we're doing. And that's exactly why we're continuing to fight Justin Trudeau's reckless, dangerous, uh, expensive carbon tax that he's imposing on provinces across the territory. You know, this is uh, something that is being supported by our counterparts right across the country. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak with many of them at uh, the interprovincial trade meetings in Halifax, and we talked about what an egregious tax this is, what a job-killing tax this is. That's why we're standing up tall for our farmers, we're standing up for our small Response. business people, our large manufacturers, our commuters, our drivers in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're doing everything they can, that we can. No taxes, no fee increases under this government, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, thank, I want to thank the minister. Minister, uh, all that we've accomplished in one year for most governments would have been enough. They would have packed it up and, and, uh, and moved on. It's, in fact, we've accomplished more in one year than the Liberals did in 15 years. Yeah. Now, the Liberal accomplishments, yeah. of course, Liberal accomplishments are lean, but what they accomplished was raising debt, raising taxes for the people of Ontario, making life harder for the people of Ontario in over 15 years. They set a record. They set a new high bar in how to spend people's money and accomplish nothing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we've done just the opposite. We've put more money back in people's pockets. Yep. We've uh, we've put ourselves on a path to a balanced budget. We're protecting what matters most to the people of Ontario, because a strong Ontario is a strong Canada. Yeah. I'm wondering if the yeah. minister, I'm wondering if the minister could continue to highlight some of the things that we've accomplished over the last year. Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, to the member again from Markham Stolville. You know, he, he's right. We have accomplished a lot. The Liberals accomplished a lot too, Mr. Speaker. They doubled our debt in Ontario, making Ontario the most indebted jurisdiction in North America, the sub-sovereign jurisdiction around the world, Mr. Speaker, $340 billion in debt. It's unbelievable the mess that they've made. We're working hard to clean that up, Mr. Speaker. We're working hard to ensure that Ontario is a destination where foreign direct investment wants to come and set up and create jobs. We're making sure that our uh, job creators who are already here can uh, create more jobs, Mr. Speaker, by reducing red tape. And we've taken many, many steps in reducing red tape through Bill 47, the Making Ontario Open for Business Act, restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act. Other red tape bills are coming, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we can make Ontario the most Response. competitive place in North America on the globe, Mr. Speaker, to do business. That's what we're focusing on, while at the same time ensuring that we're not raising taxes or fees. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, since coming to office, the Premier has incurred millions in legal fees and settlements on everything from Hydro One to Ali Khan Velshi's contract with the OPG, even to Tesla's electric cars. Speaker, legal experts are now calling the Premier's plan to rip open the contract with the beer store, quote, a public policy gaffe of epic proportions. Speaker, can the acting Premier tell, tell us how much of the taxpayers' dollars he's budgeted for legal fees and eventual settlements? Order. The acting premier to reply. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question. You know, Speaker, this is not just about beer and wine. It's not just about bringing choice and convenience, but it's about creating fairness for the people of Ontario. Now, it's interesting to know, and I'm quite sure most people in the gallery would not know this, but the government of Ontario does not own the beer store. Yes, we own LCBO, but we do not own the beer store. It is owned by three global beer multinationals, not the people of Ontario. And so we have retained a special advisor who told us that it was a bad.
bad deal for Ontarians, that this contract Order. stifles competition, it keeps prices artificially high, and it prevents new craft beer entrepreneurs from Response. getting a strong foothold in the market. So the previous government put multinational profits ahead of people, and we'll make good on our promise. <laughs> The member for Niagara Falls has to come to order. The member for Essex for his Mr. Speaker, it's obvious that protecting what matters most isn't taxpayers' dollars in the province of Ontario <laughs> under this government. <laughs> Speaker, for a guy who claims to support unbridled capitalism, the Premier seems to the government really side must enjoy come to meddling in the economy, whether it's millions of dollars spent uh, in our electricity sector or his plan to mandate businesses to display partisans ad partisan ads and pay a $10,000 a day fine. The Premier seems to have a gift of landing his government in court. Speaker, unfortunately, it's Ontarians who are going to pay the price. Right. Will the finance minister tell us today how much he's budgeted of the people's dollars for legal fees and eventual settlements? Yeah, I can hear Minister of Energy. Or to the Minister of Energy. Or to development in mind. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we're obviously concerned with the court of public opinion, Mr. Speaker, and the people of Ontario have a right to know. In Windsor, Essex alone, the two hospitals down there are going to incur, incur costs of $800,000 because of this job-killing regressive carbon tax that that Order. member supports, Mr. Speaker. Order. In 2019 alone, the automotive product sector in Windsor, Essex is going to incur $1.5 million because of the job-killing regressive carbon Carbon tax, Mr. Sorry to interrupt. The member for Essex is warned. I apologize to the minister for interrupting him. Member opposite talks about stickers, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about sticking it. How he and that party, Mr. Speaker, have stuck it to the people of Ontario for a significant cost that we need not incur to fight, uh, Mr. Speaker, our environment. We can lower Response. GHG emissions with an Ontario-made plan, Mr. Speaker, without uh, adding on a job-killing regressive carbon tax. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. We're not yet halfway through question period, and I think it's important to remind the members that our practice has been in recent months that if you're warned and if the speaker has to call you to order again, you, you may very well be named. Start the clock. The next question is the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Speaker, last week I joined parents and grandparents of children with autism at a round table in my riding of Ottawa South. And here are some of the concerns that they expressed. The new OAP needs to be needs-based. The age cap and categorization of children are barriers to care. There is no transparency around the expert panel, and it's late. We also know the government secretly froze the wait list last fall. And now we know, Order. and now we know that no new families have been able to register for the program since April 1st. There has been no the Minister of Children, Community for and the Social new Services OAP. must come to order. So my question for the acting premier is: Does the acting premier believe that this is acceptable? The question is to the acting premier, Minister of Community, uh, uh, Children, Community and Social Services. Questions referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Let me address a couple of the uh, erroneous. Uh, messages that I just heard. First, 500 children have received uh, um, their childhood family budget letters this week, so we started to remove kids off the wait list as of April 1st, just as I promised. Uh, speaker, I want to address the fact that the, the wait list was frozen. That's completely untrue. In fact, the system was broke and broken. That's why I had to go to Treasury Board to sustain the children that were on the plan for an extra $102 million, thanks to the Treasury Board President, thanks to the Finance Minister, and thanks to the Premier of Ontario. But I'd also like to address one other thing. He said the Autism Advisory Panel is secret. I'd invite the member to check Twitter right now, because the names of those that are on the list have just been released. Supplementary question. I'd, Speaker, I'd like to uh, thank the minister. I'd, I'd like to remind the minister there are parents that are here every day, and you're not just responding to me, you're responding to them. And the intake is not open, and you know that. And I'm glad you've announced the expert panel, but there was no transparency. Okay. I'm going to interrupt the member. You, you've got to make your comments through the chair. We're addressing each other in the House. Comments through the chair. There has been no transparency around it, Mr. Speaker. And we know, we know that you're doing 500 letters a month, which means 
many families are going to wait years for care. So you've done 500 letters, but you know the list is bigger. So this week, the Premier said, Speaker, in an interview, inside, come to order. people who are raising concerns, were raising concerns, had their hands in the public trough. So let's look at the Premier's record. First of all, he's made OHIP plus, OHIP minus. Okay, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw his unparliamentary. Withdraw. Sorry, I, I withdraw. Speak. And conclude your, your question. Thank you very much. So let's look at the government's record on children so far. They've made OHIP plus, OHIP minus, half the increase for social assistance, fired the child advocate, put these families through hell, okay, cut the funding for Children's Aid Society, and the list goes on and on and on. And every day we learn something new. So has this government declared war on children? And Mr. Speaker, through you, does the minister think Question. that opposing these things is having your hand in the public trough? Okay. I was, sorry. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. I withdraw. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services to reply. Let's be perfectly clear. 500 children this past month are now off the wait list. That was our priority on April the 1st. We are delivering on that commitment. We believe every single child with autism in the province of Ontario should get a level of support from their Ontario government, unlike the previous Liberal administration that allowed three out of four children or 23,000 children to languish on a wait list, a system that was broken that required an addi additional ejection of $102 million just to keep a 8,000 children in service. No one has lost service. 500 more children have gained service. I wished he had checked out Twitter. If he wants to talk about transparency, there's over 26,000 people following me, and they would know, and he should know, that Order. Dr. Maria Butriani, the former Minister of Children and Youth under Dalton McGuinty, is co-chairing my panel. Order. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Member for Ottawa South has to come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Our government inherited a broken, broke, inequitable and unsustainable Ontario autism program that left 75 per cent of the precious children waiting for services languishing on a wait list indefinitely. I was pleased when the minister took action earlier this year to introduce a new plan that would clear that Liberal wait list and ensure every child with autism would receive support. These were important steps, but the minister has also promised that this government will do more. And over the past month, our government has been engaging with parents, family members and service providers to help inform how we can best provide additional enhancements to support children and youth with autism who have complex needs. Speaker, can the minister Question. update the legislature on the progress of our government's consultations? The question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very services. much, as Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to respond to the member from Eglinton Lawrence. I'd like to thank you for all of the work and the advocacy you have provided to our government with respect to this particular file. As I mentioned in the previous question, my commitment to, and my priority has always been to uh, eliminate the wait list that 23,000 children, uh, three out of four children in Ontario with autism that we inherited. The government has engaged in public consultations through an online survey and six ta telephone town halls. And I'm pleased to report over 2,300 Ontarians participated uh, and completed the survey, and over 1,250 Ontarians participated in our telephone town halls. I'd also like to thank members of this assembly, including the Green Party leader, the NDP member for Kitchener-Waterloo, and as well as many members, including the Minister of Transportation, who have held roundtables in their constituencies. We're taking that feedback, and I'm pleased to announce today that we are releasing Response. the Autism Advisory Panel, uh, who will be co-chaired by the Liberal Minister of Children and Youth from 2003-2006, Marie Butriani, and the Executive Director of Autism Ontario, Mark Spolstra, and many more who I'm excited to tell you about. Thank you very much. <laughs> the supplementary question. Through you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response and for her relentless work since day one to ensure that every child with autism receives support from the Ontario government, as they deserve. I am glad to hear that so many Ontarians have participated in our government's consultation on this important issue. I will continue to encourage families in my riding of Eglinton-Lawrence to participate. 
to help inform additional enhancements to the Ontario Autism Program. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how these consultations and the new advisory panel will ensure that Ontario has a program where children with autism who have complex needs receive appropriate support? Minister. I'm very excited. As we know, our initial commitment was the $321 million program, which was a, an enhancement of $56 million from the previous Liberal administration. In fact, what we did after April the 1st is Premier Ford decided he would unlock an additional $300 million, so we'll be working towards a more needs-based system for the kids with the most complex needs of extended contract, and I'm so excited that Dr. Marie Butriani and Mark Spolstra will uh, co-chair this extremely talented group of people, including the Ontario Autism Coalition, including Ontaba, including Autistics for Autistics, other clinical experts from across the parent uh, province, as well as parent advocates, and they will feed all of that information that we have heard to see how we can best address a needs-based system in the province of Ontario with the most expensive system this province has ever come forward with, with over $600 million dedicated towards children with autism in this province. The speaker, I could not be more proud to be part of the Ford's administration so that we can put forward a good, sustainable program unlike what we were inherited. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Toronto Raptors are heading to their first-ever NBA Finals tonight, and we're all excited. Kauai, Canada loves you. Stay with us. It's going to be maple syrup for life. You know it's sweet. But, but watching the game at the Scotiabank Arena is just out of reach for too many fans. Game 1 Raptors tickets sold out within half an hour thanks to a feeding frenzy by scalpers, forcing Raptors fans to pay 2,000 bucks for the average seat. Even standing room on the balconies is going for over 1,000. One of the first things this government did was side with scalpers and rip up protections that would have capped ticket resales at 50% of their original values. Shame. Why does this Premier believe Raptors fans should be gouged like this? Questions been placed to the Premier. Minister of Economic Development. Heard from the Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you over here on this side of the House, we are extremely excited about tonight's game one of the NBA Finals. And I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, that's Kauai. The PC government is fully behind the Toronto Raptors. You know, the NDP could bring anything grinding to a halt with negativity, Mr. Speaker, even something as exciting as this, Mr. Speaker. You know, but what we've done is we saw the previous Liberal legislation that was completely unenforceable. There was absolutely no way that we were going to be able to enforce this. And what it actually was doing, Mr. Speaker, was driving more people to the black market. So we've taken some steps, Mr. Speaker, increasing penalties to discourage black market ticket sales, cracking down on illegal ticket bots, making ticket sellers provide clear and easy to understand information about ticket availabilities, getting rid of the print at home fees, Mr. Speaker. Response. We're doing everything we can to support Ontarians and the Toronto Raptors, Mr. Speaker. Stop the The member for Nag, sorry, St. Catharines has to come to order. The member for Windsor West has to come to order. The member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek has to come to order. Yes. S start the clock. Supplementary question. Last year, the Toronto Star and CBC revealed that Ticketmaster, who monopolizes the sale of Raptors tickets, were double dipping and secretly helping scalpers online. And rather than stand up for sports fans, the Minister of Government and Consumer Services is siding with scalpers. He saw no problem with tickets being resold for $60,000. $60,000, speakers. No everyday family can afford that. When it comes to ticket sales here, there's no transparency, and the only real choice fans is to get ripped off by ticket sellers. That's the only choice fans have here. Will the Premier direct his minister to reverse course and start protecting fans and standing up for sports fans in this province? Right Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, 
Well, while the NDP and the Liberals are focused on playing politics with ticket prices, we're celebrating the fact that for the first time in their 24-year history, the Toronto Raptors are in the NBA Finals, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's a very exciting time. And as you can imagine, uh, the arena holds uh, 20 plus thousand fans, not 60,000 fans like in the early days at the Rogers Centre or at the Sky Dome. Stop the clock. This is the Parliament of Ontario. It's not a basketball game. <laughs> We're not spectators at a basketball game. Start the clock. Minister to reply. Speaker, this is run by Canada's NBA franchise. People in this city are ecstatic. They're going to be down at Jurassic Park, formerly known as Maple Leaf Square, Mr. Speaker, and spread all the way over to the Sky Dome. Tens of thousands of fans are going to be packing bars and restaurants, not just in Toronto, Mr. Speaker. Response. The Raptors have swept the country. I was just in Halifax. Representatives from across the country are excited. I know Jurassic Park East is going to be in Pickering, Mr. Speaker. This is an exciting time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, is warned. The next question, the member for King Vaughan, starts the Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. On June 7, 2018, our government received a mandate to lower taxes, to grow the economy, to balance our budget, all while protecting the social services our families depend on. Under the leadership of our Premier, we are acting decisively to restore confidence in the markets, hope in our workers that Ontario's best days remain ahead. Under our plan, Ontario is leading the nation in economic growth. We are leading the nation in attracting the most immigrants to this pluralistic province. We lead the nation in jobs growth, 170,000 full-time, overwhelmingly full-time private sector jobs in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we're just getting started. We unveiled a responsible plan, Budget 2019, that places Ontario on a prudent plan to balance while returning thousands of dollars back to the pockets of families, of seniors and our young people. Speaker, exactly where it belongs. To the Minister. Can you outline how our plan for jobs and growth is instilling confidence in investors at home and abroad? Questions placed to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from King Vaughan. Yesterday, Fitch announced that they are moving Ontario's outlook from negative, as it was under the Liberals, to stable. As a result, as a result of the responsible path that we have put the province on. Speaker, during a recent meeting with Fitch, we explained our five-year path to balance, our debt re re reduction strategy, and the initiatives we have already taken to control runaway spending. We told them how our government is creating a climate that is open for business, open for jobs, by lowering taxes, providing more focused training programs, eliminating unnecessary regulations and red tape. This is great news from Fitch, and it's a result of our government taking a responsible approach to balance balancing the budget while protecting what matters most, Speaker, our world-class health care and our education system. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you. And back to the Minister. Yesterday, as the Minister noted, Fitch Credit Rating Agency announced that we are moving Ontario's outlook from negative, as it was under the Liberals, to stable as a result of the responsible path we have put our province on. This government is taking immediate action to unshackle this province from the constraints imposed on them by the former provincial and current federal Liberal governments. Yet the Liberals are content increasing deficits and imposing higher debt levels on our children, debt that leads to service cuts or tax hikes, debt that crowds out future governments' abilities to invest in a sustainable health and education system. The Liberals have demonstrated no fiscal restraint, no value for money, no plan to make life affordable. Speaker, no way can these yeah, Liberals yeah. return to power and further erode the social services of our children. That's why from day one we've taken action to unleash the potential of our province Question. and our people. Minister, could you outline ev further evidence that our plan is working, from creating jobs to attracting 
attracting investment and signaling to the world about Ontario's renewed economic momentum. Here. Once again, Minister Finance. Thank you, Speaker. This news from Fitch came just two days after DBRS rating agency confirmed the province's rating as well as stable. DBRS stated that, quote, the ratings are supported by the province's diverse and growing economy, effective debt and liquidity management practices, as well as the improving direction of fiscal policy. They further added, quote, the change in fiscal policy is clearly positive from a credit perspective, and there appears to be a genuine and credible commitment to addressing the province's budget imbalances and gradually reduce the debt burden. Speaker, our plan is working and the world is taking notice. The business community in Ontario created 170,000 jobs in the last year. Response. For the first time in 15 years, businesses once again have confidence as Ontario as a place to invest, grow and create great jobs. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This week is Victims and Survivors of Crime Week, a chance for us to work with victims and survivors to have their voices heard in our criminal justice system. Sadly, this government doesn't believe victims of crime deserve support. Maybe that's why they're cutting millions of dollars that would have gone towards compensating victims of violent crime, Speaker. Money that covers things like their funeral costs, physical therapy, and their loss of income. Does the Premier believe that cutting compensation is a just outcome for victims and survivors of heinous acts of crime? Question is to the Premier. Attorney General. Referred to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, the NDP has, voted, has just voted against a budget that will increase support for victims of crime from $25,000 to $30,000 a year, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Current, under the old system, Mr. Speaker, victims of crime were waiting one, two, up to three years to get the compensation that they need after, in the aftermath of a crime. And so our government took action to make sure that we can make, ensure that victims of crime are getting the compensation that they need in a faster, more efficient way. That is why we're switching from an adjudicative model to an administrative model, Mr. Speaker. That means that a victim will no longer have to appear before an adjudicator to decide on how much compensation should be paid, that they will be able to, that they will be able to submit their paperwork and receipts to the ministry, who will issue a simple Receipt. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to ensuring that victims get the support that they need in a more timely, Response. efficient ma way, and we will continue to do that. Sure. Supplementary question. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Unfortunately, that's not what we're hearing from advocates across this province who are concerned about this government's cuts and the new funding compensation model for victims and survivors. The Toronto Star has reported that a victim of human trafficking was previously awarded the maximum amount of $25,000 entirely for pain and suffering. She planned to use this money to get her life back on track, go to school, and support her two children. But with these new cuts, survivors like her will not be able to get the much-needed support that they deserve. Why is the Premier making it harder for victims and survivors of crime to access the supports and services they need for a speedy recovery? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To ensure that our government is meeting the needs of victims of crime, and uh, the member opposite is highlighting some of the growing needs that victims of crime are facing, victims of human trafficking uh, require great support. And to, to address those growing needs, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of the Attorney General is overseeing a cross-ministerial review of all the supports that the provincial government provides to victims to make sure that victims are not simply an afterthought, that we are not providing programs when we understand that new pro problems arise, that we are thinking thoughtfully and providing meaningful uh, supports to victims regardless of the crime. Mr. Speaker, this will ensure that victim programs in Ontario are victims-focused, that they are sustainable and that they are designed to meet, as I said, the growing pressures on the sector. Mr. Speaker, the previous government failed victims and made unfunded promises. Our victim support system, Mr. Speaker, will be sustainable, it will be victims-focused, victims and it will ensure Response. that those who need help get the support that they need. Next question, the member for Barrie, Springwater, Oral Medante. Mr. Speaker, 
My, my question is for the magnanimous Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Hey. For over 90 years, the Ontario Mining Association has done remarkable work. It's helped our province improve the mining sector, and it's helped ensure it's sustainable for generations to come. We all know that mining is a major job creator in the north and for suppliers throughout Ontario, like Brotec, the Premier was at recently. It's also the largest private sector employer of Indigenous peoples in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This is a fantastic success story for this province, and it's one our government intends to build upon. Speaker, the minister spent yesterday morning with the Ontario Mining Association. Would the minister please elaborate on our government's firm commitment to making the mining industry open for business? Yeah, no. Minister for Energy, Northern Development, Mines, and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for uh, Barry Springwater or Medante or Deputy Downey, as we fondly refer to him, Mr. Speaker, for his important work in this place and for his constituents. He's right. I spoke to the Ontario Mining Association at their AGM, Mr. Speaker. The future is looking a lot brighter. They like the way that we've sharpened the focus of the Northern Ontario Internship Program, particularly with respect to Indigenous uh, youth, Mr. Speaker, leveling the playing field and making it more accessible for them to get on-the-job training, Mr. Speaker, to work in the energy sector, to work in the mining sector, Mr. Speaker. The two go hand-in-hand hand as we work closely with mines across northern Ontario to push them across the starting line, Mr. Speaker, and it's transforming some of our towns. White, ri White River is on, on the move, Mr. Speaker, thanks to some last-minute interventions by this government so that they could begin extraction Response. activities. Greenstone Gold is moving on to the next step, and a leave to construct is just on the horizons, Mr. Speaker. And Newmont Gold Corp's Borden Mine, Mr. Speaker, is set to revolutionize and be electrified in the new look of the mining sector. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, Ontario is lucky to have a government and a minister that is taking action to make our province more competitive. We eliminated the job-killing cap-and-trade carbon tax. We repealed the costly Green Energy Act, and now we passed the Fixing the Hydro Mess Act. These measures are important to the entire provincial economy, but especially in the mining sector. Mining is an electricity-intense industry that requires delivery of large quantities of power. I'm confident our minister is keeping the best interests of the mining sector in mind when making key energy decisions. Would the minister please tell the members of this House more about how he is leveraging his role as minister responsible for the energy file to support Ontario's mining industry? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, if there was a low point in the discussions the other day, it was around the Industrial Conservation Initiative uh, during the decade of darkness from the previous government, Mr. Speaker. Two significant problems cost and cost uncertainty, Mr. Speaker. And frankly, as I, uh, pr as I proceed with our consultations across this province in sectors, we hear it over and over and over again, Mr. Speaker. High costs and unpredictable costs, uncertain costs, Mr. Speaker. We're working to change that, and it's important for the mining sector, Mr. Speaker. I mentioned the board mine in Chapleau, Mr. Speaker, as it goes uh, completely electrified. We've got new mines coming on board that need new, more affordable options for energy, Mr. Speaker, and everything is on the table as we proceed with our uh, uh, consultations, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that northern towns Response. have operating northern mines, because a strong northern Ontario is a strong Ontario, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here, here. Next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Speaker, and through you to the Premier. The Conservative government has given us another example of its reckless cutting to incredibly valuable programs. This time, they have cut at least nine programs aimed at stopping invasive species in Ontario. They've, cut, they've made cuts to the Ontario Invasive Species Council, a group that combats the advance of plant species that harm biodiversity, recreation, agriculture, land values, and a whole lot more. In my riding of Kingston the Island and all islands and all across Ontario, we are fighting poison parsnip, which can cause skin and eye irritation, burns, and blistering. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters said it was blindsided by these cuts, Speaker. Can this government explain why it does not care about the harm that invasive species do to landowners, farmers, gardeners, and nature lovers, Speaker? The question Minister of Infrastructure. Referred to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, uh, for that question. Um, uh, for you, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the uh, member opposite is, is well aware of the uh, fiscal uh, hole that we were left by, uh, by your party, quite frankly, and by uh, the Liberals, a, a $15 billion uh, deficit. We've had to 
review uh, every line uh, when it comes to spending uh, throughout government. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, we recognize as a government the uh, importance of preventing, responding to, and removing invasive species uh, in our province. I want to uh, highlight an announcement that was made uh, a couple of weeks ago by our outstanding member from uh, Sault Ste. Marie, who uh, announced $850,000 in the Invasive Species Centre uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. I know that was uh, wholeheartedly endorsed by the Ontario Response. Federation of Anglers uh, and Hunters. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, our government is going to continue to promote public education on the negative impacts of uh, invasive species and continue to. Uh, uh, fight with all means necessary. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and, and through you again. Uh, invasive species, they threaten about 20% of Ontario species at risk. Uh, you, a recent UN report declares that we are facing a biodiversity crisis. We know this government is not concerned about the climate emergency. We now know that they also do not really care about Ontario's natural diversity. These species have an economic impact, so it's interesting to hear about the fiscal reasons for, for making these cuts that the government has put forward. Studies reveal that invasive species plants cost billions of dollars, Speaker, billions of dollars in environmental damages, including to agriculture and forestry and anyone who uses the great outdoors in Ontario. Why does this government think it's not important to fund efforts that prevent environmental and economic damage? The Minister of Infrastructure again. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I will remind uh, the member opposite that uh, because of uh, his party and the Liberal government, uh, they added $200 billion worth of debt. Mr. Speaker, this is about our government making uh, careful decisions to protect what matters most to the people of Ontario. That's why uh, in the budget that was passed yesterday that, that you, sir, uh, voted against, uh, added uh, over a billion dollars to the health care budget, added hundreds of million dollars uh, to the uh, education uh, budget. Mr. Speaker, those are the decisions uh, that we, we have to make. We were faced uh, with a fiscal crisis uh, in this province. Uh, but in saying that, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to work with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Uh, we work uh, very, very closely with them. They're very supportive of the measures that we brought forward to Response. boost um, uh, our support for anglers and hunters uh, right across this province. And Mr. Speaker, again, we just announced the member from Sault Ste. Marie $850,000 in the Invasive Species oh. Centre uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. We know that in a digital world, being disconnected means being disadvantaged. Drop calls or lost connections put people in danger during times of emergency. Mr. Speaker, we can all agree that having reliable cellular and broadband access is critical. Despite this, there are many homes, businesses and roadways in my riding and around eastern Ontario where it remains difficult to make calls and access the internet. This poses a threat to regional economic growth and personal safety. But no longer, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a new day has dawned in rural Ontario. And our government and our government has taken decisive action to end the gap. Can the minister please tell the House about the exciting announcement he made in Roseneath in my riding on the 17th? Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the uh, amazing member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for that excellent question and for his leadership on this issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, without a doubt, being disconnected means being disadvantaged. I'm proud to have joined the member, along with my colleagues, the members from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes Brock, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, Peterborough, Kawartha, Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, and Hastings, Lennox, and Addington to announce our government's commitment of up to $71 million to the Eastern Ontario Regional Network known as EORN. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say this project will virtually virtually eliminate all cellular dead zones in eastern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, better connections means students can do their homework or take an online course. 
families can stay in touch, Response. emergency services are accessible, and businesses, Mr. Speaker, of all sizes can truly benefit from the promise of digital opportunity. Supplementary question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Here and uh, thank you, Minister, for that excellent response. Our government's commitment to getting rid of cellular and broadband dead zones across Ontario is just one more example of how we're putting people at the centre of everything we do. Mr. Speaker, we know that this is an issue for all rural communities across the province. Last week, the Minister joined me in my riding for an exciting announcement on broadband access in southwestern Ontario. We've all heard of stories of students, business owners and others, family members, having to go to a local fast food parking lot to access, access their Wi-Fi, to take care of their business, to do their homework and connect with loved ones. Mr. Speaker, for 15 years of liberal neglect, these communities have been routinely uh, abandoned and forgotten. Can the minister tell us more about this announcement and how our government is helping the people of rural Ontario? Yeah. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Applied. Speaker, and I have to thank the member of Sarnia Lambton for that great question and, of course, his leadership in uh, pushing the government to expand uh, broadband across southwestern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, rural residents and businesses should be able to stream high speed internet from their homes, farms, and businesses. People should be able to access digital services, get their work done, and connect with their loved ones. Last week, I was joined by the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs and the members from Haldeman Norfolk, Kitchener South Hespler, Kitchener Conestoga and Sarnia Lambton to announce our government's commitment of up to $63.7 million to the Southwestern Integrated Fibre Technology Project, also known as SWIFT. This is likewise a project to be delivered with support from other levels of government. We're looking forward to the federal government's support for this initiative. Mr. Speaker, affordable broadband connectivity is essential to the families and businesses in rural Ontario. With this commitment, we're proving that we're putting people at the centre of every decision that we make and protecting what matters most. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is for the individual we call the Premier. This week, the Children's Aid Society of London and Middles. Okay. That, that comment caused a lot of discomfort in the House. We ask the member to withdraw. Withdrawn. This week, the Children's Aid Society, London and Middlesex, revealed that their deficit will increase to $2.1 million even after spending their surplus saved from previous years. Instead of addressing this shortfall, the government is careening ahead with $28 million cut from children's aid societies, leaving London Middlesex children's aid workers scrambling to figure out how they're going to cover programming costs. Why is the Premier making it harder for vulnerable children to get the care they need? Questions put to the Premier. Minister of Children and Community. Referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Child welfare and child protection in the province of Ontario is extremely important to the Premier as well as myself and our entire government for the people. That's why we have started consulting with children's aid societies across the province. If the member opposite would like to provide me with uh, additional details after question period, I'd be happy to work with him and his office to ensure that we are, uh, we are protecting uh, the children in his community as much as we possibly can. Um, but I want to, to assure the member that just the other day I spent some time in my own city of the City of Ottawa working with the Children's Aid Society. We recognize that the model uh, for customary care with Indigenous children has changed over time. We recognize, too, uh, that we are trying to ensure that there is more kin-based care within the system, more so than has ever been in the past. So we will continue to work with Children's Aid Societies as we ensure that there's greater child protection. I'm looking forward to, in the coming days, announcing a child welfare panel uh, that will report directly to me and uh, provide uh, information. I'm also looking forward, throughout the coming months, in, in and traveling across the province, consulting with children's aid societies. Yeah. Supplementary question. Back to the premier. Cutting before consulting sounds like no plan at all. Speaker, this government is plowing, before, plowing forward like a transport truck without a driver. Children and youth in London need a government that supports them instead of cuts that put them further at risk. My constituents keep asking, why is the Premier cutting the budget on the backs of London's most vulnerable children and youth? 
Recently, the Premier told Travis Danrash families with autistic children are not real people because they didn't vote for him and were, I quote, the same people that have their hands in the public trough and getting money from the public, end quote. When is the Premier going to put the brakes on his gravy train, stop pandering to a socially regressive base, reverse his ruthless cuts to vulnerable children, and stop insulting hard-working families of children Thank with you. autism? Order. Order. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services can reply. Difficult to take that member seriously when just a week and a half ago he said that not one member of this assembly on this side of the legislature spoke about transphobia when actually I gave a ministerial statement to talk about that. And then he had to respond to it and he The member for London North Centre will come to order. Speaker, can I will not be bullied by that yeah. man opposite. Yeah. I will continue to stand up. Question period today and this week has come to an end. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has informed me he has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, point of order, I'd like to introduce to you and through you to members of the Legislative Assembly, the Warden of the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville and the Mayor of Edwards Road Cardinal, His Worship Mayor Pat Sale. The Attorney General on a point of order. Speaker, I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, the Honourable Peter Van Loan, who's uh, uh, joined us today in the legislature. Yeah. And before I recess the House, I, I, I have to remind the members that I, um, after repeated calls to order, I had to warn a number of members. The warnings carry over into the afternoon and evening sitting, if applicable. I warned the member for King Vaughan, I warned the member for Waterloo, I warned the member for Essex, and I warned the member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.